Good afternoon. It is actually the 16th of February, but I am preparing this for a men's meeting in Amory, Mississippi, I believe on the 27th. And I think one thing our country needs right now Men. Men. I want to encourage you today, but I also want to be honest with you. There seems to be at least as much prejudice against you and me and our gender as any race of people faced in days gone by. We have created terms in the last 20 years like metrosexual, which I've heard the term tons of times, but I, I looked it up to see how it's defined, and it's defined as a heterosexual male who is basically woke or liberal in his political views, and he's interested in fashion. So let me put that in Mississippi terms for you. He likes girls, but his conduct and conversation makes a body wonder. <laughs> that was just too much of that. And I'm telling you that even within our churches, this whole woke view, whatever woke means, of mankind has affected our view of what men should be to the point that we don't even realize in church what we expect and what we sometimes teach is affected by a worldly mentality of what a man should be. We have redefined the word meek today. And we expect men to be meek, but we don't expect men to be meek in a biblical or a dictionary definition sense of the word. We expect them to be some sissified, milk and toast, metrosexual. That's not meek. Let me tell you this. I don't believe any true woman, any woman truly desires such a man. Now, the other extreme, you got the, the woke, metrosexual, never offend anyone. And then you've got the other extreme of, honestly, it was a liberal who, who brought this idea to the forefront, I think. Uh, Bernie Sanders though it's been swept under the rug a lot, it's not really hard to find a paper that he wrote in 1972 entitled Man and Woman by Himself. In other words, by Ernie, not Ernie, Bernie Sanders. His perverted sense of what a relationship between men and women should be is so bad, I'm not even going to quote it exactly. If you, if you just have to know it used to be a, a tabloid, inquiring minds want to know. Look it up. I found it. I, I'm terrible at Google searches, and I found it in 15 seconds. But he basically said, as clean as I can make his quote, that every woman fantasizes about being brutalized. This is the other extreme. But I need us to understand that it's not just this crazy old man we might call him. He's a successful politician and author. But most of us would refer to him as that, you know, that eccentric politician from the Northeast. But it's not just him. I haven't watched them, nor do I intend to watch them. But I see them now advertised as about to come on USA. Um, the, the trilogy, The Fifty Shades of Grey, Again, I've not watched it, but I have been told that it, it fosters this mentality that women like to be brutalized. That's not what a woman wants. But what she does want is a man. So what is a real man? Biblically speaking, all this is introduction. I promise I'm going to get to a sermon in a minute. Well, the Bible says 
talking about meekness, the Bible says of Moses, Moses was very meek above all the men that were on the face of the earth. It says that in Numbers chapter 12. But I want you to know in Numbers chapter 32, if you were on the wrong side, you died. That's not a sissy. That's not a metrosexual that goes and gets manicures and pedicures and whatever. I mean, don't tell me Moses was weak like we define meekness today. If we compare context with context, meekness is power under, the, under control. Power under control. Jordan Peterson, to my knowledge, is not even a Christian. He is a well-known Canadian psychologist. He's famous for a quote, which I will slaughter in a minute. But he studied the Bible at least enough to know that meekness is power under control. He uh, explained uh, Matthew 5, where it says the meek shall inherit the earth, that this definition of meekness, which if we compare context with context, what are the rules for understanding Scripture? Context, 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 okay? If we compare context with context, he's right. Meekness is power under control. And he says that means the fellow that has a sword but keeps it sheathed is the one who will inherit the earth. Or as uh, Teddy Roosevelt said a hundred or so years ago, walk softly but carry a big stick, all right? The rule in my house growing up until I was 14 or 15 was don't throw the first punch. But if you're assaulted, you better come home to Victor. I can actually remember my father said, if you come home crying, I know there's two of those boys down the street. But if you come home crying again, I'm going to give you something to cry about. The next time they start it, you better finish it. Hmm. Now, when I was about 15, I... I mentioned that rule to my dad and his best friend, Cecil Stark. And they said, now, son, that's a rule for little boys. You're a man now. And men have this innate sense. You know when somebody's about to strike you. And when he's about to strike you, son, you hit him hard, you hit him fast, and you hit him till he don't want no more. Bad grammar, good preaching, all right? So how does this apply to us as husbands and fathers? Well, the Bible tells us, I'm still, all this is introduction, I'm still planning to get to a sermon in a minute, all right? The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 that we are to love our, uh, love our wives like Christ loved the church. Well, let's think of the love that, that Christ showed. First off, let's just throw this in here. In, in John, I believe it's 15, it says he loved them to the end. Talking about his disciples. So love is not some gooey, ooey feeling, you know. I, I mean, I love me some John Wayne movies, but there's a line in McClintock where he says, half the, women in the, wor half the people in the world are women. Why do you have to be the one that turns me on? That is so stupid and so far from the truth, okay? The truth is you decided to love that woman, and you need to decide to love her till you die, because that's what God said. One man, one woman, one lifetime, amen. If you've messed that up, God will forgive you. Love the one you got till you die, amen. Jesus loved his father's house so much that he made a whip, and he cleaned house. He ran out livestock and livestock dealer alike. And yet, Jesus loved the church so much that he laid down his life freely. He said, no man takes it from me, I lay it down. He laid down his life freely in such a way What do I mean in such a way? Such a fashion, such a mode of execution. Cicero was a Roman orator or speech giver, a politician. And he wrote, you know, I would say that he was to the liberal side of things based on this one speech. But he wrote that no man should have to die the death of the cross because there was nothing more bitter 
the whipping that Christ took, many men died of. Medical doctors have studied it and said that many men, after the scourging, as it is called, that many never made it to the cross for their entrails, their intestines were around their ankles. That whip uh, with all of those tails and sharp things would rip their stomach so badly that they, they couldn't walk because of being tripped up in... 22 feet of intestine. Yet Christ did that for you and for me, for the church. And that's the way I'm supposed to love my wife. Let me get this for you, fellas. She's first. Paul told the church at Corinth, quit yourselves like men. And as near as I understand that, that means I'm putting her first. I'm putting our children first. What they need comes before what I want. That's meekness. That's power under control. If your boy whether he's 40, 14, or 4, speaks inappropriately to your wife, you, not her, should correct him. He should know that you love her more than you love him. Did I say it? Yes, I said it. She comes first. He ought to know that you love him, but he ought to know that you love mama more. If some strange man says something hateful and inappropriate, you correct him. I have in Amory, Mississippi, told a man sitting outside the Chinese restaurant who said something, he called himself playing, but he insulted the integrity and the morality of my wife. He was standing by his father. And I said to him, as he got in a pickup truck, I stepped between the door and his ability to close it. And I said, son, and he was a grown man, but I said, if your daddy didn't teach you, I'm going to teach you something right now. There's four people in a man's life you never talk about. You don't talk about his mama. You don't talk about his sister. You don't talk about his wife. And you don't talk about his daughter. And you cross the line, and I wouldn't advise you do that again, son. And I turned around and walked away. And another man, we were actually getting ready to go do some dirt work. Another man said, oh, he's going to be on you now, preacher. I said, well, you need to understand, you're going to see a preacher fight if he says something else like that about my wife. That's been 12, 13 years. Never said anything else about my wife. I had, I've got three boys. At one time, I had three teenage boys. And I have told one of my boys, I wouldn't let a stranger talk to your mama that way, and you're not going to talk to your mama that way. A woman is comforted by the fact that her man can defend her and will defend her if someone accosts her, but she also needs a man who's willing to do his share. A man who's willing to lay down his desires to help her because she lays down her desires to help you more than you realize it. It's 14 minutes and I'm still on the introduction. Hopefully the sermon will go quicker. You know what? Most women today bring in a good portion of the family income and yet we as men expect them to do all the dishes, all the laundry, all the house cleaning, cleaning and frankly, most of the parenting. Man, you can do the dishes sometimes. You can wash some laundry, and yes, even though you would do it differently, you can do it to suit her. If I can learn new tricks, you can learn new tricks. Let's just be honest. You enjoyed making those children. Help her raise them. 
Teach them to respect her and to respect you and to respect authority. When you are raising your children, this whole wokeness has affected parenting and nobody wants to be an authority nor do we want to submit to an authority because from little children, we're not made to submit to, even to the authority of our parents. Teach them to respect authority. And dad, that falls squarely on your shoulders. Cook supper sometime if she's had a hard day. I can't cook. Okay, fair enough. You can learn to fry an egg, amen. But if you can't cook, figure out how to scrape together the money. Leave off a can of Copenhagen or four of them $4 cups of coffee and buy her some supper. Every man dreams about his wife taking care of him like on the... The, the old shows where they have his slippers ready and, and back when smoking was not so frowned upon, had his pipe ready and his paper ready and all of that. Men, this is going to be like a halftime speech in a second, but give her a reason to want to have your slippers ready, to want to take care of you. I'm going to tell you about some mighty men because I think not only are our wives and children looking to us to be mighty men, or as Jordan Peterson puts it, to be dangerous, very dangerous. The world around us is looking for mighty men. If you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23, if you have your Bible, whether it's on your phone or or in your lap, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. We typically remember the first words somebody speaks and the last words someone speaks. You know, um, <clears throat> Bo's first word, I think, was daddy. CJ's was pal. Emma's was stop it. Okay, she said dop it and not stop it, but that's basically what she said. We remember people's first words. So remember their last words. And that's how this chapter starts. Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, the man who was raised up on high, anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God, and he shall be the light of the morning. When the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springeth out of the earth by a clear shining after rain, although my house be not so with God. In other words, he already knew he's getting ready to die. He knew he made some humdinger mistakes. And like you, I have made some humdinger mistakes. But when I look back, I look back and see what God has done in my life since I surrendered to him. And you can't go back and change the things. And maybe right now, maybe you've only been trying to follow after God for this first quarter of man church. But right now, you can decide that from this point forward, I'm going to rule by God's way. I'm going to follow what God has to say. <clears throat> Although my house be not so with God, yet he had made with me an everlasting covenant. That's because it depends upon God. It doesn't depend upon us. Amen. If, if, me, if what I did ha got me saved or kept me saved, I'd be busting hell wide open right now. I ain't got a snowball's chance in July in Mississippi. Okay. This is all my salvation, my desire, although he make it not to grow. But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man, the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear. He shall be utterly burnt and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. The man that stands for God. He's got to have his spear. He's got to be strong. 
But David couldn't do it alone. Just like Brother Lloyd cannot grow uh, Meadowood Baptist Church spiritually or numerically all by himself, just like uh, he, he can't he can't lead your children by himself. A lot of times, at least in the 53, almost 54 years I've been alive, we wait on the church to do everything, men, but it's on us. If the church is going to be what the church should be, each home within the church has got to be what the church should be, and that's on me and you. So David here, he's writing about uh, his... Uh, victories that God had given him, but then he spends the next several verses talking about his mighty men, and that's what God wants you to be, that's what your wife wants you to be, that's what your children want you to be, that's what your parents and grandparents want you to be, that's what people on the sideline want you to be, they want you to be strong, that's what people need you to be, even those that are too goofy and too unlearned to know that they want you to be that, they need you to be that. A mighty man for Christ. These be the names, verse 8, of the mighty men whom David had, the tacklemite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahoite. One of the three men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and all the men of Israel were gone away. So the four stood alone. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave into the sword. And the Lord, notice this phrase, men, is what's going to make your home a success. The Lord wrought a great victory that day. That's important. It's the Lord that wrought the victory. The people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agia, the Herorite. The Philistines were gathered together in a troop where was a, a, a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood, seems like, completely alone in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And here's that phrase again that's going to make you a success. Because right now, some of you are thinking, I can't do it. And you're right, but God can. The Lord wrought a great victory. Three of the 30 chief went down and came to David in the harvest time in the cave of Adullam, and the troop of the Philistines were pitched in the valley of Raphaim, and David was then in an hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. So David's hiding out in the cave, and his enemies are in his hometown. And David longed, verse 15, and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three Mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. So they heard a desire on the part of someone they love and they risked their own lives to get it for them. Man, this would apply to your wives and children too. Hmm? Nevertheless, he, David, would not drink thereof but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did the three, these three mighty men. So that was Adino, Eleazar, and Shammah. Now we get to a couple of more, and then I'm not going to read all of the names. Verse 18, And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruhi, was chief among three, and he lift up his spear, against 300 and slew them and had the name among three was he not most honorable of the three therefore he was their captain howbeit he attained not unto the first three and benai the son of jehoiada the son of a valiant man of of Kabziel, who had done many acts he slew two lion-like men of moab i'm thinking of two big old samoans you know what i'm saying all that hair out there he went down and slew a lion in, the, in a, the midst of a pit in the time of snow. He slew an Egyptian, a, a goodly man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, and he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benai, the son of Jehoiada, and had the name among three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty, 
but he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the privilege of of preaching to these men at Meadowwood, Lord. I pray that you would uh, strengthen them. I pray that you would encourage them, Lord. If there's one there today that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that they would come to know you tonight. I, I will do my best, Lord, as you lead to present the gospel. And I pray that you'd give them the good sense to talk to, to Keith or Patrick or Jason or, or, or CB or Brother Lloyd or Brian or somebody, Lord, Mark. There's so many people there who could lead them to you. I pray they'd talk to one. Lord, for those of us who do know you, I pray that this would be a, a, a fire lit under our backsides, Lord, so that we would be the men that you've called us to be, Lord, mighty men for Christ Jesus, amen, mighty men for the Master. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. First thing I want you to see about all five of the fellows I just read about is they exceeded the status quo. Now, uh, they exceeded the status quo in their faith. They believed God. What does the word faith mean? Faith is the evidence of things not seen, right? That's what the scripture says in Hebrews. But I like an acronym, and I don't know who first came up with it, but forsaking all, I trust him. Well, we've got to exceed the status quo. Just coming to church a time or two a week, that's not showing our wives and our children how much we love Christ. The status quo is average. I'm just as good as the next guy. Man, I need to be a leader. Exceed the status quo in my finances. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be frugal with my money, but I'm going to pay God what I owe in the tithe, and I'm going to give God a, a love gift on top of the tithe once I get into a position where I can. Maybe I'm in debt now, and, and the tithe is, is all I can do. So great, do that. And as soon as I can get past the tithe, I'm going to get into the offer, man. As soon as I get myself out of debt, I'm going to start giving to God because he's the one that gave me the finances. In your fervor, in your fervor, don't be one of those lukewarm Christians. You ever had, I, I don't know, I know some of y'all drink iced coffee. I, you know, I think it's just, well, it's not for me, amen. I'll just say it that way. I like it hot and black. And uh, occasionally I put cream in it, but very occasionally. I want it hot. If I put cream in it, it cools it off. Well, if I pick up a cup and it's not cold, but it's not warm, <clears throat> spit it out, right? what Christ said. That's what Christ moved John to write to one of the churches in Revelation. I would that you were cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, I spew you out of my mouth. Don't be that lukewarm Christian, man. If it's worth doing, do it right. Ecclesiastes 9.10 said, Whatsoever thy hand finds it to do, do it in a woke fashion. <laughs> no! It says do it with thy mind. Give it all you got. That same thing, men, applies to our fatherhood. We should love our children in such a way that they see the love of the Father in us. Hmm. We should love our females in such a way that they see the love of the Father in us, meaning our wives, right? Faith, fervor, that's why I went with female. I'm not trying to degrade them. I just like alliteration, amen. Everyone who knows us should know that we're above average Christians, and we're above average in our finances, we're above average in our fervor, we're above average in, in our love to our family, wife and children. Beyond that, they expected the supernatural expected the supernatural now look help me lord there's a story that's a true story of a young man who asked a famous preacher who was over a bible college he was attending how come he wasn't seeing uh the fruits that others were seeing and the older man said, well, do you expect God to work? And the younger man bowed his head and said, well, no. And he said, son, that's the first problem. The Bible says over and again that we must believe that he'll work. 
Expect God to move. Expect God to help you out of your financial problem. Expect God to, to, to fix your marriage that, that, that's probably in a wreck because of your own doing. Expect God to help you be the father your children need, the man your wife needs, the employee your employer needs, the church man that your church needs. It is because of those two things they exceeded the status quo and they expected the supernatural that they experienced success. These men were no different than any of you. And, and I could call several, several names that are probably sitting there listening right now. But I would invariably leave somebody out just like I did when I was pray, praying. And I don't want to offend anybody by leaving someone out. But I'm going to tell you, whoever you are, just everybody in the room right now, raise your hand. These men were no different than you that have your hands raised. And if you didn't raise your hand, they're still no different than you. If God can work in them, he can work in you. You have just got to be to expect the supernatural, to, to exceed the status quo, and then he'll give you the victory. If you look at uh, Adino, Boy, talk about getting made up. I mean, people found out my daddy's name was Grover and my middle name was Stuart, and I got a bunch of grief on the playground. I broke a few noses over it. But his name was Adino. He exercised faith in God's man. Right now, you guys have a pastor, Dr. Lloyd Swift. You have Sunday school teachers, depending upon your age, Casey, Key, Patrick, Mark. You have, I think Coach Mickey teaches a class. You have substitute or pinch hitter, Scott Cantrell. You've got older men in the church, CB, Mike Riley, and so many others. Frank, Robert, you've got men like Brian. God gave a vision to see this man church thing. And Keith, again, I'm going to invariably leave somebody out. But exercise faith in them. There's, there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. If you're struggling with something, man, talk to Brother Sweat. Talk to Brother CB. Talk to Brother Scott. Talk to Brother Luke. Talk to Brother Brian. Talk to Brother Chris. Talk to Robert. Talk to somebody. Exercise faith in the call of God's man. And when he shows you something, follow it. You know what? You're going to have to exercise faith in the caution of God's man. Sometimes you're going to want to do something, and Brother Lloyd or Casey or whomever is going to go, you know, can't put my finger on it, but I don't think you should do that. They'll probably come to the point later that they can put their finger on it, but you need to exercise faith in the call, in the caution of God's man as well. And then you need to, you're going to make a mistake. And sometimes Brother Sweat or, or whomever is going to say, hey, man, boy, you really you really messed that up. You know, here's maybe you could do this to, to, to repair the damage that you've done. And it's probably going to start there at an altar. Tough being your own cameraman. <laughs> you look at old Eleazar. He exemplified fervor. Now, people have jacks to hold up drywall anymore, and, and they have, you know, screws that are that are on a, a little plastic strip so you don't have to hold a screw. When I started hanging drywall in my early teens, it took three men to hang a, a 12 foot sheet for sure. And you had to kind of hold it up with one hand and you kind of had to hold the, the nails in your other hand and you had to swing that hammer up. And at the end of the day, even after you put that hammer down, your hand was like this, because you were swinging, depending upon how much of a man you decided to be, 16 to 20 ounces, you're singing to a pound to a pound and a quarter. You're swinging that over your head up all day. At the end of the day, your hand's like this. That's the way his hand was on his sword. When's the last time you've been in the God's Word so much that you 
couldn't let it go. It had a hold to your mind. It claimed, exemplify fervor, man. Show your kids what it means to be a real man who loves Jesus. And then you look at uh, Shammah. Shammah was engaged in the fight. Too many of us. Like, I don't know, y'all probably seen these videos floating around with Fleckus and other people that have these, these podcasts, but people just standing around watching one person beat the absolute fool out of a defenseless person who's not doing anything. People who see an old man standing on the street corner and run, bump, knock him out, all right? Or uh, three people beating on one people and other people just... Stand back watching it. Man, be engaged in the fight. I'm not necessarily talking about those physical fights, but tell people about Jesus. Invite people to church. Uh, lead your family to the scriptures when they have a question. If you don't know the scriptures, man, call your Sunday school teacher. Call your pastor. Call your youth pastor. Call Jason. Call somebody. Who are you going to call? Don't call the guy in New Albany selling Fords. Call the preacher, and he will give you a verse to answer the need that at hand. But exemplify fervor and be engaged in the fight. This was, if you look at the scripture here, you couldn't just run down to Walmart and buy some more beans. If they lost these beans, they were going to have a hard winter. This was a vital fight, and it was a visible fight. Get in the fight. The fight to see our country turn back to Christ. The fight to see your, your children love Jesus and serve Jesus. And you look at uh, uh, everybody else has gone away. Sometimes you're going to fight when nobody else is helping you. He fought alone, it looks like. But in both cases of Shammah and Eleazar, the Lord wrought the victory. Extend favor to God's man. Feed him. I know you take care of him. But say amen when he's preaching. Fire him up. Say amen. Say, come on. Say, pull up right there, amen. Fuel him. There's two kinds of preachers. Ones that like it when people say amen and ones that lie and say it bothers them. I don't know what to say, preacher. You know what to say when you're at the ball game. So don't say blood makes the grass grow. Kill, kill, amen. <laughs> don't say that, but say something. Ask the Lord to give you something to say. Some people say glory. Some people say hallelujah. Some people say amen. Say something. Beat him. Fuel him. And even Lloyd is going to make a mistake. I know that's hard, probably hard for Brother Lloyd to believe. But everybody's going to make a mistake. And you know what? Let's flip that around to our wives and children. Show them that same. Feed them. Fuel them. And forgive them. They need to hear Daddy say, that's a good job getting an A in math. I hated math, but I'm glad that you're excelling where I failed. Good job catching that ball, son. Good job making that block, son. Good job taking your Bible to school and inviting your friends to church, son. Good job shooting that deer, catching that bass, whatever. Encourage him. You want him to be a mighty man when he grows up, you're going to have to feed him. You're going to have to fuel him, and you're going to have to forgive him when he messes up. And some of you right now are thinking, I can't do it. Maybe younger ones, like them teenage and 20-year-old boys that are probably sitting there. Be an example follower. I can never outline the way Brother Lloyd does, but I can try. Fact is, I stole this outline from another man, but I've been preaching it 20 years, probably more than he has. I can follow after Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Say that to your boys. Say that to your daughter. Say that to your wife. 
be an example follower, and be someone they can follow. Every Paul needs a Timothy, men, and young men, every Timothy needs a Paul. Older men, middle-aged men, every Timothy needs a Paul. Old men, you're going to have to follow after Christ because ain't nobody older than you left, but you still follow after somebody. Example followers. This old last guy, man, he just embodied fortitude. We feel like we can't do this because it's, it's too great a task. But he slew a lion. I mean, he slew two lion-like men. Hmm. Some people, well, I sing. Well, you know, I can just fix a motor. That's all I can do is fix a motor. We feel like we're specialized in one thing. Listen, the Christian life and being a man for your family, it's very task. Sometimes you're going to have to be a plumber because you don't have the $200 to call somebody to come fix it for you. Sometimes you're going to have to be the plumber for your buddy because you've experienced this and you know what to do and you need to help your buddy out. And yeah, you're going to have to give up something, but your wife and your kids are going to respect you because you loved your friend more than you love sitting on your butt and watching your football game. Or your baseball game, or your basketball, March Madness. You're going to have to go help somebody. It's a, the volume of the task sometimes looks overwhelming. But remember, it's the Lord that gives the victory. The very task. I can't only do the things that I like to do. Sometimes I have to do the things that I detest to do. And finally, the viciousness of your task. He slew a goodly man. That's a 300-pounder that's over six foot tall. He had a stick. The guy had a spear. He went to him with the stick, took his spear, killed the man with his own spear. But he also slew a lion in a pit in a time of snow. You ever hit your finger with a hammer when it's cold? It's either going in your armpit or in your mouth. Because it seems to hurt worse when it's cold and you feel like it's going to hurt less. It's just instinct. You either jam it up in your armpit or stick it in your mouth. You're going to warm that dude up. But your wives, your children, and to be perfectly frank, the man in the mirror is going to think more of you if you're a dangerous man who is under control of the Holy Spirit of God. That's probably about three minutes longer than I was supposed to go, but I believe with all of my heart this is what God wanted you to hear today, men. Now, some of you are thinking, man, I've messed up. Then the verse for you is, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, he not only takes away the sin, he takes away the sorrow if we let him. Some of you are sitting there going, I can't do that because I, I don't, I don't, the Lord's not going to write a victory for me because I'm not saved then you need to understand God loves you. But you're a sinner. Our sin, just like I am, our sin has a salary. Christ paid the price. Man, I can understand how Christ would die for Lloyd Sweat. I can understand how Christ would die for Grover Stewart Holman, but he died for me. I look myself in the mirror. I know me, bless God. The most amazing four words in the scripture are Christ died for us amen and we all fit in that now you can understand all that friend and still go to hell there has to come a time when you believe in your heart and you confess it with your mouth the same lord overall is rich unto all who call upon him for or because whosoever shall call upon him call upon the name of the lord shall be saved shall be not maybe but if you're saved friend your life's going to show it. We used to sing, if you're saved and you know it, then your life should surely show it. But the fact is, the Bible said that. John said, bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. In other words, prove that you've followed after Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For or because we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath before ordained that we should walk therein. If I'm saved, my life's going to show it. If any man be in Christ, 
He's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Don't tell me you can't be a mighty man for Christ. And don't look that man in a mirror and tell him he can't be a mighty man for Christ. Because God's no respecter of persons. You can be the man that your wife, your children, your church, and your community respects. And you're making that happen one choice at a time. Love you.